People have expressed uh, the desire to come back again, and they've uh, expressed how much it's meant to them today. They've heard, thought they've got some good insights into how this place works and some of the things that our people are concerned about. And for that, we're proud that these speakers came and gave you some insight into what was going on. And bring us to our last speaker of the day as uh, Steve Neal will introduce uh, our final speaker of the day. And we want to thank you folks for coming. And we assure you that you're going to get out of here in plenty of time to catch your plane and make your connection. So, Steve, if you would, you introduce our final speaker. Before doing that, let me, someone just told me that uh, our senior congressman, Walter Jones, has died. And uh, I thought I would share that with you. Maybe you would want to share a moment of silence here. It's a uh, pleasure, as you know, Walter had been sick, and I know that that's not entirely unexpected, but we will certainly miss him. Uh, you know, we so often hear what's wrong with uh, the way we're doing things and the way our government works, and there are plenty of problems with it, and there are plenty of things we need to fix. But one of the real, I think, unheralded success stories of recent years is the fact that we've brought inflation in this country down uh, from a rate of, uh, I don't know, I guess it hit 13, 14 percent, something like that, uh, in the late 70s, early 1980s, under the leadership of Paul Volcker. And, uh, and with the pain of a recession, brought that rate of inflation down to about 5% or so, and it hovered there for a while. And then we got a, a new uh, Fed chairman, Dr. Greenspan, our next speaker. And uh, he, uh, her he shepherded uh, monetary policy uh, through some tough times, and then through a persistent effort, has ground it down now to a little over 3 percent. Um, this is a fabulous accomplishment, I must tell you. And we will enjoy incredible benefits from this over the next few years. You're already seeing it in lower uh, mortgage rates. Mortgage rates now are at the lowest point in 30 years, maybe longer. Uh, short-term rates, of course, are at the lowest point they've been in in a long, long time. And once this is fully uh, established, fully appreciated, uh, this is going to mean that we can enjoy uh, sustained growth, sustained prosperity. There's hardly anything that will help our economy more than uh, getting inflation on down the rest of the way, I would hope, to zero as soon as we can, and then keeping it there and enjoying the, the uh, interest rates that that will produce for us. Well, anyway, that has been accomplished under our uh, next speaker, Alan Greenspan. Uh, I uh, have uh, the pleasure of introducing him. I'm the chairman of the banking subcommittee that has oversight responsibility for the Federal Reserve, so I spend a lot of time on this subject. And uh, I've become an admirer of uh, Dr. Greenspan's because of the fine job that he's done in this area. Um, and I say that in a very bipartisan way, I want to point out, because Dr. Greenspan has spent most of his time serving uh, Republican uh, public figures. He was um, uh, the, um, of course, named to this post by uh, President uh, Reagan first, then by uh, President Bush. He was uh, Chairman of President Gerald Ford's Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, he was uh, on President Reagan's Economic uh, Advisory, uh, Policy Advisory Board. And uh, you may remember that he was chairman of the uh, National Commission on Social Security Reform. And of course, before that, uh, he was uh, not just an ivory tower ec economist, he had been out in the uh, uh, in the real world, working as an economic uh, economics consultant and a very effective one. Well, um, he has done an outstanding job. He's an outstanding public servant, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, Alan Greenspan.
I'm sure I'd get, I'm, gonna, I'm about to get myself in trouble with some of my colleagues, but if I were in Steve's district as a Republican, I'd still vote for him. <laughs> what I thought I might like to do uh, this afternoon is uh, give you a general idea of how we at the Federal Reserve see the economy, not only of the United States, but to a broader sense, the world at large, and try to carry you through a procedure which I hope will clarify what's causing the system to tick. And maybe at the end of my remarks, uh, uh, hopefully, come to a certain view of what's happening so that we'll understand the process which is creating so much hardship and so much difficulty for so many of us. This is a different type of business cycle that we're going through. It's a type of cycle which we have not seen in any form since the end of World War II. And indeed, if one goes back into the business annals of earlier periods, much of what is going on today has a certain resonance of the late 19th century. Because what we have in the United States, and indeed, what even in a more extraordinary form is going on in many other areas of the world, the United Kingdom, the uh, Nordic states, uh, especially Japan, is a cycle which reflects the old-fashioned sequence of something which increases the market value of many assets in an economy, and in our country it was basically commercial real estate, residential real estate, stock prices and the like, financed on the way up by very large quantities of debt, but followed inevitably by reality reasserting itself and the market values coming back down and households, businesses uh, being hung up with pretty strained balance sheets, debt burdens, and grave concerns about meeting fixed costs. In the United States, uh, we started, I guess, basically in the latter part of the 1970s and early 1980s with a very low vacancy rate in the commercial construction, rather in commercial buildings. And when uh, we perceived a shortage of building, in part caused by tax laws which essentially were outdated and required a much longer period of depreciation than the economic life of a building would dictate, what we had was a shortage of commercial building. Well, we changed the law, but unfortunately, as is too typical of the way we tend to do things, instead of bringing the depreciation lives which are out this long and should be this long, we brought them to that long. And that created a very dramatic incentive to build, and we had what you are all aware of on a nationwide basis, an explosion in commercial real estate construction, tremendous expansion, uh, of our underlying office facilities and office square footage, financed to a very substantial extent by financial intermediary debt and to a surprising extent from commercial banks who increased their proportion of assets devoted to commercial real estate by a rather surprisingly large percentage. But most importantly, individuals and businesses 
uh, committed themselves to very substantial debt burdens. And when property prices began to tilt down uh, in the latter part of the 1980s, and when the fairly dramatic rise in the value of residential real estate began to flatten out, and while it has not gone down appreciably, it's gone down some, what everyone felt to a greater or lesser extent is the pressure of the debt that had been taken out to fund and finance uh, all of this activity. And of necessity, there had to be a time out for redressing strained balance sheets. Individuals and businesses have a cash flow. That is, as individuals, we either get a salary uh, or we have dividends. We have just cash coming in the door. And obviously, the same goes for business. We can do several things with that cash flow, but the most important is that we can devote part of it to repay our debt or part of it to buy goods and services. Normally, the vast proportion of that cash flow by business and individuals is devoted to buying goods and services, and that's what engenders economic activity. But what we get into the special case that we have just found ourselves in recent years, where in a sense we have to have time out to repair our balance sheets because we are overcommitted, then a disproportionately large part of that cash flow gets diverted to the repayment of debt or the accumulation of liquid assets which may have been drained in the process of the balance sheet strain. What that means is that goods and services spending at retail, capital investment, building of homes, buildings of everything, all of that comes down a notch to offset the monies being diverted to save, that is, to repair the balance sheets. And as a consequence of that, what we get, and indeed what we have had, is a very sluggish economic environment uh, which has been dragging on largely because uh, we have, while we have made very material progress against the overall debt burden, we still have a way to go to come out the other end of the tunnel. And it has been a very difficult period. As most of you know, and for which I do not have to outline in great detail, uh, the various different hardships that have occurred, the level of consumer confidence, the various different elements of concern which has afflicted uh, the vast majority of us. As far as we at the Federal Reserve, the central bank, are concerned, uh, what we see is a system which is out of whack. That is, balance sheets are strained. There's too much debt, not enough equity, not enough liquid assets. It indeed is the type of sense of relationship between incomes and assets which people and businesses feel uncomfortable with and are trying to redress in a manner which would re revert them back to a greater degree of normality. This is the reason we see such a dramatic decline in, for example, the level of installment credit outstanding, which has been going down fairly appreciably in the last number of months, a general reflection of the endeavor on the part of individuals to get themselves in a better position where their 
monthly commitments are reduced to acceptable levels. What we see, obviously, as interest rates on mortgages fall is a dramatic acceleration of refinancing of mortgages, which has the effect of reducing the interest burden that households have from their fairly substantial mortgage debt commitments. And those interest payments, as you can well understand, with the two episodes of the very heavy refinancing we've had this year in the mortgage market, early this year and in the most recent period, there's been a fairly appreciable decline in the ratio of interest costs on mortgage debt uh, and this has freed up a goodly part of cash flow and as part of the process of adjustment has also uh, increased the, uh, I should say, has decreased some of the overall debt burdens of households. There's also been a very dramatic increase in an endeavor to refinance by business who have been borrowing heavily in the capital markets, selling bonds, and to a substantial extent, new equity, a substantial part of the proceeds of which have been used to pay down bank loans. And I might add one of the reasons why uh, we see that uh, loan demand amongst bankers is so extraordinarily soft is that the shift from short-term bank loan debt by the larger businesses who can afford to finance in the capital markets, that that shift has gone from short-term bank loans into long-term debt, and the net effect has been to substantially reduce commercial and industrial loans in our banking system. The overall pressures on the part of the Federal Reserve to try to restore these balances uh, are, are directed largely at the fact that, one, once the imbalance in the balance sheets are there, once there's been too much in the way of debt commitment, too little in the way of equity, and very heavy debt payments as a percent of cash flow, you cannot eliminate that by a wave of the wand. The adjustment has to take place largely because until people get their balance sheets back in balance, until their debt burdens are down where they can sleep at night, the adjustment process will continue. The big difference between what used to happen under these conditions in the 19th century and now is back then it used to happen with a rush and we had what we used to call financial panics and the economy just sort of folded up and collapsed and when I said we needed time out well what happened was everyone ran off the field very quickly and the whole thing shut down and we had these massive crises which did correct the imbalance. It liquidated a lot of people, the adjustments took place, and the economy was able to gradually restore itself. The difference now with central bank intervention, which is what we central bankers have learned in the last several generations, is that we have the capability not to eliminate the adjustment. That cannot be done and should not be done but we can spread it out, smooth it out, and reduce the degree of hardship which is associated with the adjustment process. And that's the process that we at the Federal Reserve have been embarked upon to, in a sense, stretch out this adjustment by pumping significant but calibrated amounts of liquidity into the system enough 
to bring interest rates down and to hold the liquidity, but not so much as to veer us off the very crucial path of reducing inflation, which is a primary, if not the primary uh, technical goal in this period, bringing inflation down to set the stage when we finally get out of this adjustment period so that we will have maximum long-term sustainable economic growth at that time. Uh, it's a tricky balance in monetary policy. If you do it, if you try to bring liquidity up too fast, that is bringing interest rates down too fast, you threaten to trigger an inflation acceleration, and that creates all of the problems we're now dealing with. If, however, you do it too slowly, you risk the possibility that the emergence of the adjustment processes of the 19th century, which are based on human nature, which hasn't changed an iota since then, will all of, all of a sudden confront us. So we have been trying to walk a very narrow path. Uh, you get the sense that we're walking on a path at night, which is winding, without a searchlight. And it's only when uh, we step off the edge periodically that we know quick adjustments are required. The interesting question is, how long is this process going to last? And the answer to that is we don't know for sure. We do know, in looking at the data on balance sheet relationships, on cash flow, on interest rates, and the like, that we have adjusted somewhat more than half the excesses which occurred in the household sectors uh, over the last decade to 15 years. That means we still have got a way to go, but I might add it doesn't follow that until balance sheets of households are back exactly to where individuals want them, nobody spends anything. What happens is, as we get over this hump, uh, people begin to get a little uh, more uh, willing to spend, and even though they are still paying off debt, adjusting their balance sheets, they are beginning, or will begin when this process occurs, to start to divert increasing proportions of their incomes to the purchase of goods and services. Similarly, when that occurs, you begin to get the pressures on businesses to expand. At the moment, what we are seeing is a business sector which has a very appreciable improvement in its, its balance sheets and in its cash flows, but it too has not yet gotten to the point where it's where I would suspect they would, in general, like to see their balance sheets. But there's no question that we have made very substantial progress, and in certain respects, maybe even somewhat more than half of the distortion which set in during especially the latter part of the 1980s with the very heavy accumulation of debt in, in the business sector, to a large extent reflecting leveraged buyouts, but very heavily the expansion and financing of commercial real estate. Certain things are happening with this significant refinancing which the corporations and large businesses, in fact, businesses generally, are doing, is that the ratio of interest payments to cash flow is falling, and a substantial part of that improvement is going into profitability, which is being enhanced by a significant increase in restructuring on the part of business as part of their concerns about 
they're balance sheet distortions. And so what we find is the combination of very significant cost reductions in business, coupled with the interest payment declines, corporate profits and business profitability generally has opened up quite appreciably. Profit margins are finally opening up. And what this means is that when demand picks up in the consumer area, there is the cash availability, the rate of return, the liquidity for business to start moving in the capital goods area. They really haven't started to do that yet. We see a goodly part of investment in computer and computer-related technologies, but we just don't see the heavy type of capital investment which, coupled with a rise in consumer expenditures, is the typical set of locomotives which usually take us out of a recession. We are, in fact, increasing the levels of economic activity. In a statistical sense, and from an economist's point of view, the bottom of the recession occurred in the spring of 1991, and the economy has sort of been trudging along at a very slow pace uh, since then. But the truth of the matter is, it's a plus, not a minus. But the concern that businesses have had, basically because of their excessive debt and the lethargy that they see in the marketplace, is that they are extremely chary. And as a consequence of that, they have engaged in far more cost containment, restructuring, squeezing down workforces than one has seen in anything remotely uh, in, the, in the annals of the post-World War II period. What that has done has created an extraordinarily large dearth of job creation basically for two reasons. One, the implications of cost containment and improvements is that productivity, that is output per worker, rises. And indeed, since the beginning of this year, we've had a fairly strong increase in productivity. The flip side of that coin, obviously, is if you need fewer hours to produce a unit of good, obviously you also need fewer people. And as a consequence, the demand for people, demand for workers, has declined in that context. Secondly, largely because, as best I can judge, business is very much disinclined to take on new workers in this environment possibly in part because of the increased costs of, of medical care and a variety of other fringes, but basically because of the slowness of the economic recovery. The average work week in American business has gone up very appreciably. So that means that even with the low demand for workers, the average work week is allowed to increase very significantly, which means that instead of bringing new people on, we're working our existing workforce ever more intensively. The combination of this extraordinary increase in productivity since the beginning of the year and the dramatic increase in average hours work per week both of which are far in excess of what one would normally expect in this type of environment. If we did not have these abnormalities, these extraordinary, the above normal increases in productivity, the above normal increases in the average work week, we would have added far in excess of a half a million new jobs in order to produce the level of output which we indeed turned out. 
So what we're looking at is a state which I guess the best word is fear. That there is a general fear out there which pervades the business community, which means they're pulled up tight in all respects. And one needn't go very far into the statistics on the part of consumers to see that that same concern pervades consumers as well because our consumer confidence indexes clearly have exhibited a significant weakness uh, over the last year or so. This is an interacting process because as consumers get concerned and they accelerate their balance sheet repair, their savings, reduce the level of retail sales, reduce the incentives for business to move forward, you begin to get business pulling back and they hold down the increase in employment in just the manner which I have been discussing. So it's a self-reinforcing issue. Eventually we get out of this largely because the average work week has reached extraordinarily high levels and in a sense we're running out of room not to bring new people on as the economy gradually increases. And it's hard to believe that the extraordinary productivity gains which have been implemented through uh, waves of cost cutting can continue. So what, what is going to happen invariably, this is what the arithmetic necessitates, is that if the economy trudges forward as it's doing in a very lackadaisical but persistent way, eventually it has to pick up the demand for new workers. That is likely finally to change the tone of the economy and to carry us forward I would suspect uh, into a period of moderate growth. It's hard to define it, but clearly one which is far superior to where we are today. But a period, hopefully, surrounded by an environment which is conducive to an acceleration in long-term growth a state in which the inflation rate is low, meaning that people do not have the uncertainties which are associated with inflationary instabilities and therefore the type of problems which people tend to pull back on because they're fearful of what, uh, what's going out in the world. They also uh, are confronted with a change in the structure of the American economy which is going on underneath all of this, which is really quite benevolent. Now, we are concerned that we're somehow losing our technological edge, that uh, America has had it, so to speak. Well, when you look at the underneath a lot of these details, you get to see something really quite interesting. I mentioned before that there is uh, capital investment going on to a significant degree in computer and computer-related telecommunications type equipment, and indeed it is. And what you find is that that is an economic system which is driven basically by software. And Whereas we may have gone astray in certain consumer electronic products and our original technological leads went offshore, we are number one in software and that is becoming an increasingly crucial part of a highly sophisticated industrial economy of the 21st century. So as we look out beyond this period of balance sheet repair and readjustment and the concerns that all of us have is actually a far more benevolent outlook than I think we have yet allowed ourselves to focus on. 
A substantial number of us, according to the polls, are fearful that our children and our grandchildren will not have standards of living that we have experienced. The data suggest that is wrong, that there is still a powerful force for incentives and initiative and ingenuity in this country that while we are indeed having very serious problems and have had them for a number of years and I cannot say to you that next week or next month everything is going to change for the better but what I do know is that underlying all of this things are developing in a positive way so while I wish to say I wish to be able to tell you I could say this uh, extraordinarily uh, uh, period of uh, weakness is about to end. Uh, I don't know that. I don't think anybody knows that. We do know that the healing process is underway, but we don't know yet how long it's going to take. But we do know that when it's healed, there will be a basis in this country for a very strong economy in this country and those who looking into the future and have bemoaned the, the long-term potentials of the American people are almost surely going to be proved very wrong. Thank you very much. Even though we're running a little bit beyond our time, I gather, uh, I do have some time for a few questions. I just want to warn you that there are certain things that central bankers all of a sudden become very dumb at. And that's <laughs> things like what's going to happen to interest rates, what's going to happen to exchange rates. It's like I had a prefrontal lobotomy. <laughs> but I'll try, to, I'll try to do the best I can. Yes, sir. How important is the uh, federal budget deficit to the long-term future growth of the economy. Some people have suggested we should spend more. I'm, I'm, I'm less. glad you asked that question because uh, it is an issue uh, uh, that uh, I had in my notes and meant to uh, raise on the negative sides of the problems that confront us, which one can view as important challenges which have got to be addressed. The budget deficit as such does not produce crises. What it does, it eats away at our innards slowly in a corrosive manner. It does it by diverting savings from the system. In other words, there's a certain amount of gross private savings which is engendered in this economy a substantial part of which right now is being used for the repair of balance sheets. But the first claim on that savings in the economy is to finance the federal government deficit because the federal government has first claim in the sense that it, meaning we, will pay any price to sell bonds to meet the difference between receipts and expenditures. What that means is that we are diverting savings from productive uses, from the monies that go in to finance capital investment, which is a crucial and necessary element in the advances of living standards. So what the deficit has done is diverted savings essentially from investment into consumption for a number of years. And unless we come to grips with that and resolve that issue, which I must say I have every reason to believe that we shall, then a goodly part of the beneficence which I'm expressing about the future would have to be adjusted slightly. I hope that that is not the case. 
But there is no doubt that if we leave the deficit out there to continue to grow and to eat into the savings pool of this country, uh, we are foregoing some extraordinary benefits that are out there for us to achieve. Yes, ma'am. in line as an individual could get. In other words, as an individual, you could get a fixed rate, but on a commercial mortgage, you cannot get a fixed rate, not at a reasonable amount. Thus, uh, the small business person cannot do long-range planning because fear of what's going to happen with the economy. Is there anything can be done about that? Well, you're raising one of the issues which concerns us greatly because one of the things that's fairly apparent when we look at the structure of finance, the larger corporations, the well-capitalized corporations, don't need commercial banks. They don't need the type of financing that the average small business, medium-sized business needs. And the effect that we have seen as a consequence of the lax lending standards in the commercial banking area which very clearly over lent on commercial building in ways which in retrospect I find difficult to understand. But the consequence of that is that bankers being human beings, uh, I know that's a difficult thing to... to uh, uh, they, they do respond uh, with the same characteristics of human nature that we all have. And the result is that having been burned so badly, they have pulled back. And anything which says commercial real estate mortgage on it gives them a mild state of fright. And obviously, it is quite important so far as we at the central bank are concerned and my fellow regulators to see what we can do to try to turn bankers around not to get them to lend the way they were lending in the past but to get a rational policy of lending which doesn't go from one extreme of laxity over here to absolute fear over here but come out somewhere in the middle I can't say we have had great success. We've worked very hard, and I think we've moved the ball from here to there. We are pushing, we're continuing to push. We have meetings with bankers, our supervisors, our examiners, continuously meet with them. We're trying to make certain that where we can, we can reverse this process. But I will tell you, human nature is a tough thing to try to push aside. So I say to you that uh, we are aware of this problem. We're doing what we can to get it resolved. It will ultimately resolve as the uh, balance sheet strains improve. But for a person like yourself, I suspect it's a short-term difficulty. And the future is the future. But the, the now is the now. Uh, I just hope we can make more progress than uh, we've been making. I certainly personally have not been satisfied with what we've been able to achieve to date, even though I certainly cannot uh, question the extent to which our institutions have really moved to try to resolve this issue, because we've put in an extraordinary amount of effort, but I think the, out, the, uh, the input has been terrific. The output is less than I would like. Yes, sir. The impact of the development of software on our industry uh, is somewhat akin to our developing microchips and transistors and we let the world. Can you stand up this I'm sorry. sorry. This, this business of the development of software as a, as a major player in our uh, coming out of the recession that we're in, it's the first time I've heard this mentioned. Uh, since we've done this before with transistors and microchips and things like that, then somebody caught up. Is there something we could do with regard to protecting our lead in this, uh, in this particular uh, world? No, I don't think you can. And I think that uh, 
uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much because one of the things that we have observed is that the area where America does extraordinarily well is where individual input and imagination uh, is involved. And this old, these, you know, these old stories about all the things that get done in garages in the United States, that's still true. And uh, there's no way that you can protect our lead except just continuously move forward, innovate, continue, continually to find ways to implement things better. Our competitors in other countries who certainly don't lack technical capabilities, obviously don't lack IQ, are missing the incentive structure somewhere, somehow, which still creates an extraordinary environment, uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, set of values in this country, which is really the only area, I should say, it's the it's the part of our culture which enables us to take the elements of capabilities that we have and convert them into very important economic values because uh, if we are moving towards a technological age, which obviously we are, then it is those individuals who are capable of employing that physical hardware to do things which creates wealth, value, value added, things which are of use to human beings. And that is what is the real thrust of software and I would suspect one of the reasons why uh, uh, we have done so well, and I would suspect that so long as our culture, our incentives, our basic underlying way of doing business uh, remains the same, I think we'll be very tough to catch. I have time for one more question. Now, this will sound like a partisan question, but it's not intended to be. Uh, <laughs> in your opinion, this period of adjustment that we're going through and the recovery from this, is it going to be about the same length of time regardless of who's in the White House? Um, I can say the answer is no, it depends on who's in the White House. That's about as far into politics as I am going to get. That's like the question they asked the amazing Mr. Ballantyne, why do you wear white tennis shoes? He said that's a two-part question. Why has been asked for centuries, people have asked why this and why that. Do I wear white tennis shoes? Yes. <laughs> well, we, again, we'd like to thank you folks for uh, your patience through our ineptness to get you fed today. And I hope that the program today has been uh, stimulating for you and I hope you've had a nice trip here. I hope you've enjoyed your visit here in Washington and we'll look forward to having you again next year. Again, we want to thank you for coming and being with us. We hope that you have a pleasant stay here and a pleasant trip back home and as a very good friend of mine back in Cabarrus County says, I hope you live as long as you want and never want as long as you live and God bless you and thank you for coming.
uh, this afternoon is uh, give you a general idea of how we at the Federal Reserve see the economy, not only of the United States, but to a broader sense, the world at large, and try to carry you through a procedure which I hope will clarify what's causing the system to tick. And maybe at the end of my remarks, uh, uh, hopefully, come to a certain view of what's happening so that we'll understand the process which is creating so much hardship and so much difficulty for so many of us. This is a different type of business cycle that we're going through. It's a type of cycle which we have not seen in any form since the end of World War II. And indeed, if one goes back into the business annals of earlier periods, much of what is going on today has a certain resonance of the late 19th century. Because what we have in the United States, and indeed, what even in a more extraordinary form is going on in many other areas of the world, the United Kingdom, the uh, Nordic states, uh, especially Japan, is a cycle which reflects the old-fashioned sequence of something which increases the market value of many assets in an economy, and in our country it was basically commercial real estate, residential real estate, stock prices and the like, financed on the way up by very large quantities of debt, but followed inevitably by reality reasserting itself and the market values coming back down and households, businesses uh, being hung up with pretty strained balance sheets, debt burdens, and grave concerns about meeting fixed costs. In the United States, uh, we started, I guess, basically in the latter part of the 1970s and early 1980s with a very... Uh, Short-term rates, of course, are at the lowest point they've been in in a long, long time. And once this is fully uh, established, fully appreciated, uh, this is going to mean that we can enjoy uh, sustained growth, sustained prosperity. There's hardly anything that will help our economy more than uh, getting inflation on down the rest of the way, I would hope, to zero as soon as we can, and then keeping it there and enjoying the, the uh, interest rates that that will produce for us. Well, anyway, that has been accomplished under our uh, next speaker, Alan Greenspan. Uh, I uh, have uh, the pleasure of introducing him. I'm the chairman of the banking subcommittee that has oversight responsibility for the Federal Reserve, so I spend a lot of time on this subject. And uh, I've become an admirer of uh, Dr. Greenspan's because of the fine job that he's done in this area. Um, and I say that in a very bipartisan way, I want to point out, because Dr. Greenspan has spent most of his time serving uh, Republican uh, public figures. He was um, uh, the, um, of course, named to this post by uh, President uh, Reagan first, then by uh, President Bush. He was uh, chairman of President Gerald Ford's Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, he was uh, on President Reagan's economic uh, advisory, uh, policy advisory board. And uh, you may remember that he was chairman of the uh, National Commission on Social Security Reform. And of course, before that, uh, he was uh, not just an ivory tower ec economist. He had been out in the, uh, uh, in the real world working as an economic, uh, economics consultant and a very effective one. Well. Uh, he has done an outstanding job. He's an outstanding public servant, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, 
the Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, Alan Greenspan. I'm sure I'd get, I'm, gonna, I'm about to get myself in trouble with some of my colleagues, but if I were in Steve's district as a Republican, I'd still vote for him. <laughs> what I thought I might like to do... People have expressed... Uh the desire to come back again, and they've uh, expressed how much it's meant to them today. They've heard, thought they've got some good insights into how this place works and some of the things that are people are concerned about. And for that, we're proud that these speakers came and gave you some insight into what was going on. And bring us to our last speaker of the day as uh, Steve Neal will introduce uh, our final speaker of the day. And we want to thank you folks for coming. And we assure you that you're going to get out of here in plenty of time to catch your plane and make your connection. So, Steve, if you would. You introduce our final speaker. Before doing that, let me, someone just told me that uh, our senior congressman, Walter Jones, has died. And uh, I thought I would share that with you. Maybe you would want to share a moment of silence here. It's a uh, pleasure, as you know, Walter had been sick, and I know that that's not entirely unexpected, but we will certainly miss him. Uh, you know, we so often hear what's wrong with uh, the way we're doing things and the way our government works, and there are plenty of problems with it, and there are plenty of things we need to fix but one of the real, I think, unheralded success stories of recent years is the fact that we've brought inflation in this country down uh, from a rate of, uh, I don't know, I guess it hit 13, 14 percent, something like that, uh, in the late 70s, early 1980s, under the leadership of Paul Volcker. And, uh, and with the uh, pain of a recession, brought that rate of inflation down to about 5% or so, and it hovered there for a while. And then we got a, a new uh, Fed chairman, Dr. Greenspan, our next speaker. And uh, he, uh, her he shepherded uh, monetary policy uh, through some tough times, and then through a persistent effort, has ground it down now to a little over 3%. Um, this is a fabulous accomplishment, I must tell you. And we will enjoy incredible benefits from this over the next few years. You're already seeing it in lower uh, mortgage rates. Mortgage rates now are at the lowest point in 30 years, maybe longer. Flow, that is. As individuals, we either get a salary uh, or we have dividends, we have just cash coming in the door, and obviously the same goes for business. We can do several things with that cash flow, but the most important is that we can devote part of it to repay our debt or part of it to buy goods and services. Normally, the vast proportion of that cash flow by business and individuals is devoted to buying goods and services, and that's what engenders economic activity. But what we get into the special case that we have just found ourselves in recent years, where in a sense we have to have time out to repair our balance sheets because we are overcommitted, then a disproportionately large part of that cash flow gets diverted to the repayment of debt or the accumulation of liquid assets which may have been drained in the process of the balance sheet strain. What that means is that goods and services spending at retail, capital investment, 
building of homes, buildings of everything, all of that comes down a notch to offset the monies being diverted to save, that is, to repair the balance sheets. And as a consequence of that, what we get, and indeed what we have had, is a very sluggish economic environment uh, which has been dragging on largely because uh, we have, while we have made very material progress against the overall debt burden, we still have a way to go to come out the other end of the tunnel. And it has been a very difficult period. As most of you know, and for which I do not have to outline in great detail, uh, the various different hardships that have occurred, the level of consumer confidence, the various different elements of concern which has afflicted uh, the vast majority of us. As far as we at the Federal Reserve, the central bank, low vacancy rate in the commercial construction, rather in commercial buildings. And when uh, we perceived a shortage of building, in part caused by tax laws which essentially were outdated and required a much longer period of depreciation than the economic life of a building would dictate, what we had was a shortage of commercial building. Well, we changed the law, but unfortunately, as is too typical of the way we tend to do things, instead of bringing the depreciation lives, which are out this long and should be this long, we brought them to that long. And that created a very dramatic incentive to build. And we had what you are all aware of on a nationwide basis, an explosion in commercial real estate construction, tremendous expansion uh, of our underlying office facilities and office square footage, financed to a very substantial extent by financial intermediary debt and to a surprising extent from commercial banks who increased their proportion of assets devoted to commercial real estate by a rather surprisingly large percentage. But most importantly, individuals and businesses uh, committed themselves to very substantial debt burdens and when property prices began to tilt down uh, in the latter part of the 1980s and when the fairly dramatic rise in the value of residential real estate began to flatten out and while it has not gone down appreciably, it's gone down some, what everyone felt to a greater or lesser extent is the pressure of the debt that had been taken out to fund and finance uh, all of this activity. And of necessity, there had to be a time out for redressing strained balance sheets. Individuals and businesses have a cash